Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode in my Manium tutorial series. There was a pretty long delay between the last episode and this one. And basically this is because uh, I found that there were some inconsistencies in how Manium uh, treats today's uh, topic, which is update functions. And so I wanted to have these sort of fixed um, before I actually produce an episode about it. With the latest release of Manium, which is as of today, um, v0.15.1, the general status is still messy, but I feel less bad about it. Note that while the general content of this episode uh, does apply also to older uh, versions of Manium, or at least the vast majority of the content of this episode applies, um, I still do recommend upgrading whenever possible. As usual, please find uh, the links to all of the code and resources I'll mention throughout this episode uh, down in the uh, video description. And in particular, we can also run the examples I'm presenting here uh, right in your browser by following the link to the interactive online Manum environment. All right, so with that, let's jump right in and see whether we can demystify updaters a little bit. First of all, we should talk about what even is an updater function. The answer to that is not as difficult actually. It's a special function uh, that is called right before Manim captures a new frame. So imagine in the end what Manim does to produce a video is it constructs some sort of timeline and evaluates the scene, uh, your position of the objects and the, all the stuff that happens uh, and evaluates them on in certain time steps. Um, at these special points it constructs one of these frames and then camera captures it, the render renders it and that's, that's basically an, a still image. Before that happens uh, in each of these time steps, uh, which basically depend on your on your frame rate, um, before it happens, these updater functions are called and the scene is updated according. They can come in different flavors. Basically, on the one hand, they can be attached to objects, which is what we call object updaters then, or the scene itself, although that's a lot less common, actually, uh, which is what we refer to as, as scene updaters. It can also depend on the time passed since the uh, last rendered frame, so basically one over the frame rate, which is what we what we call time-dependent update. As you will see, these play a sort of special role how Manim constructs the scene. Next question, why are updater functions useful? Well, you can make some objects dependent on other objects, positioning on their status in general, and that's what makes them very, very useful. I'll give you one example. Imagine this here. We construct the scene where we have some sort of two dot. Um, we add label for this for this dot, uh, and we move this label next to the dot. What happens now is if we move the dot away, then the text would not move with it because it's not attached to the dot. However, using updater function, we can construct this sort of attach. This happens in these lines over here. We can add an updater function, this is the syntax, so you take the object, add an updater to it. So here I use an inline function, so an object, which is a function that gets an object as an input argument, and we want the function to place the object next to the blue dot above it. That's what this all does. The thing you need to know about updaters is, we'll talk a little bit more about their syntax later, but basically when you add an updater like this, this means that the object it is being added to is input into the updater function every frame. This means the dot label gets input into this function here, right before the frame is kept. Which means that the label is moved next to the blue dot, wherever the blue dot is located. Right, and in the rest of the in the rest of the scene, we just uh, add the objects to the scene, play some animations, moving the dot around, and we will like to see in the rendered output dot moves around and the label moves with it. First, we positioned it using the updater right above the dot and we forced it to stay above. Its position is being updated. So let's briefly talk a little bit more about uh, different types of updaters. Basically, there's one thing I should make very clear here. The following characterization of updaters is valid for up to the current release, which is Manim v0.15.1. There is one thing about this that developers don't quite like and that we are likely to change uh, in the future at some point. Keep an eye out for the video description in case something severely changes compared to what I'm about to say, I will leave it here. Okay, so on the one hand, we have already heard there are object updaters, which is when you take an object uh, and, and call object.addUpdater, pass your function there, 
done, perfect. This can take one or two positional arguments and an arbitrary number of keyword arguments. In case there's just one uh, positional argument, this is the mob object itself. So this is the, the, the mob object that is being passed itself is being passed to the function. If there is a second argument, and this is this is the part that developers don't like right now. If there is a second positional argument, and if this second positional argument is named dt, then the updater is considered the so-called time-based updater, and the uh, time difference since the last update will be passed it, which is again basically one over the frame rate if you 60 frames per second then this will be one over the second type of updater is uh, scene updaters you add those to the scene by calling well self dot add updater uh, you pass a function that has exactly one positional argument which is the time difference scene updates are always time dependent and you can pass arbitrary an arbitrary number of keyword arguments to them all right now let's go and construct an example where we use all three different types of updaters to kind of see where the differences are. All right, so here's my idea for the uh, scene that contains all different kinds of updates. In my scene, there should be a dot and an arrow, and the arrow should be placed left of the dot, so, so it points towards the dot. Then we will attach uh, an updater to the dot, which makes the dot move around. Uh, and simultaneously, there will be a, a scene updater, which sort of makes the objects smaller or larger, depending on how far they are away from the origin. That's the that's the basic idea. I've prepared my file already. Uh, it's empty apart from the manim import in the beginning. I'll add a new a new scene. It's called all updater types class all updater types scene def construct. Um, I'll add a red dot and the arrow left to it, as I've said, so there's a red dot, which is a dot that is red. Amazing. We shift it left. And we will also add a pointer, which is an arrow uh, pointing into the right direction, and then we place it left of the dot. So, which means I want an arrow that points from origin. Uh, to right and then we place it next to uh, the red dot and left of it okay now the, the arrow points to the dot all right let's add an updater to the pointer so that it stays left of the dot so we add a object updater pointer dot add updater what do we want? I'll just specify it here in the comments so that we know later. Uh, we want to place the arrow, place arrow left of dot. And here I'll write an inline function again. So lambda mobject. Um, the mobject should be placed next to the red dot, namely left of it. All right, that's enough. That's the inline function that makes sure that the arrow stays left of the dot. Next, and the, I'll, I'll write uh, just for, for changing, changing things up a bit, I'll switch to a, a proper defined function. So let's uh, let's define a function called shifter, which will take care of, of shifting the dot slowly throughout time. So this, now, this should be now a time dependent updater, which means I have to give it two positional arguments, the second being called dt, so we have the object which is passed and then the time difference dt what do we want we want that this function should make the dot move two units or units actually uh right per second how does the function have to look like well we just we shift the object uh and now, if I imagine the time difference being one, then I want to have it shifted uh, by two units, which means that I shift it by two times dt times uh, right. You can always imagine dt being one so that you see the effects of, of like one second of, of this updater being applied. All right, that's the updater. And now we add this to the red dot. So red dot, add updater to shift the function. All right, so now we've both seen an inline way of adding the updater and the, the 
well, normally defined function which is being added as an updater. Now let's, uh, as the third updater that I want to add, uh, let's add a scene updater which kind of makes the objects smaller the further they are away they are away from the origin. How do I do that? Well, one idea that I could do is I define a function, scene scalar. I pass the time difference. Remember, uh, scene updates are always time dependent, so they always need this this sort of argument. Uh, scale objects depending on distance to origin. Um, and now what I will do is I'll loop through all of the objects that are contained in the scene, which is which I can do by running a loop or object in self.mobjects. So all the objects of the scene are stored in the self.mobjects list. It's basically the list where objects are added when you when you call self.add or when an animation adds something to the scene. And then I'll set the width of the object to some fixed value. So object.set width should be and I want something that gets smaller as, as, as uh, the further the, the object is away from the origin, which means that I kind of want to have like some some one over the distance. And to avoid getting any problems with with uh, objects that are exactly on the origin, I'll do one over one plus the distance, which means that it can never be zero in the denominator. So let's go with uh, one over one plus. The distance of an object to the origin can be computed using the norm of a so-called uh, of the of the center um, vector. I just use NumPy and and compute that. It's basically like uh, uh, the the Pythagorean theorem uh, that can be used to compute this. Linalg dot norm of the object dot get center. So now this is. 1 over 1 plus the distance of the object center uh, to the origin. Uh, all right. You know what? Actually, let's make the objects a little bit larger. Let's uh, multiply by a factor of 2 so that we can actually see some expanding and maybe getting smaller. Otherwise, I'm worried that we wouldn't see it too well. Okay. We add the updater. Scene scalar. So you see... Uh, the first two times I added the um, object to a, uh, I added um, the update to a um, object, and this uh, the, the third time we add the update to the scene itself. All right, and with that, well, let's add all of the um, objects and then see what happens. Uh, self dot add the red dot and the pointer. And one thing that we should also do is we should initially update the scene once because right now the the objects are not scaled correctly which means that there will likely be a sort of weird uh, first frame of the animation because well actually um what would happen what would happen if if we if we just uh started the the, the animation for the first frame first the object updaters are applied which means the arrow is moved next to the dot which is fine it's already there and then in the second step, the scaling would happen. What would happen is that the scaling would destroy the positioning of the object, which, which would require the object update to run again. Or alternatively, we just scale them initially once and then the object updater does the right thing when it's first run. So that's what I'll settle for. I'll update self, which is the command for the scene to run all of its updaters uh, and pass the time difference that, that uh, happened so far which is zero and then we just wait so this time we can create our animation by just waiting uh all right looks good to me let's go and render it one word of advice whenever you are um whenever you're working with updater functions um you should render your scenes with disable caching with the disable caching flag because manim is bad at, de at detecting um changes that are made only within your updater function it can't properly see those in, in a certain sense. Uh, so what might happen is if you change something in your updater function and you run the, the program again, it doesn't recognize that something has changed and just uses the, the animation that has already been rendered instead of working again and properly displaying your changes. So we'll use 
uh, disable caching, caching, there we go. Okay, rendering, and there's our animation. As you can see, the dot and the arrow are well, scaled somewhat, and the closer the dot to the origin gets, the larger it gets, and then as soon as it's past the origin, it gets scaled downwards again. Same for the arrow, the arrow first gets longer, and then as soon as it's past the origin with its with its uh, center, gets smaller again. It's the further the, the objects are away from the from the origin, the smaller they become. Late. There you go. Dot moves, the arrow moves with it, and the updater function makes sure that everything is, is well scaled. When working with updater functions, there are a few things that you should uh, take care of. And here is one particularly common pitfall that we see over and over uh, in, in questions that people ask. Uh, namely, when you loop over some, some list of objects and want to attach an updater to each and every one of them, then you have to take care, you, you have to be aware of how scoping works in Python. If you do something like this, where you, where you uh, loop over the length of some list and you want to assign every object in the list an updater data function and you have some code that involves uh, the index uh, that, you're, that you're looping over here, then you need to add the, the, the uh, index as an, as an keyword argument to your updater data function. If you don't, then at the end, after the loop is evaluated, the i will have the same value, the last one namely. Passing it like this will make sure that the correct value of i is used. This is one thing that you have to well, be aware of, let's say. It's, it's actually quite tricky to track this one down if you're not aware of what you're looking for. So whenever you, you uh, loop and add up updaters in a loop, make sure to add the loop variable as a keyword argument. There's one cool thing about updaters, which is um, they often uh, keep running through animations. You have finer control about these uh, with the suspend updating and resume updating, and I'll actually show you an example for this particular concept um, in, a, in a minute. I'll just let me mention the third thing, namely, whenever you suspend an object from updating, so disable the updaters for a little while, the updaters are resumed automatically as soon as an uh, animation has been played. And another thing to be aware of, um, without time-based updaters, Namely, if you, if you just add the, the normal object-based ones without a second DT argument. If you don't have any time-based updaters and no scene updaters in your, in your scene, then the wait function will produce a static frame. So if you do something manually with, with updating, incrementing some, some, some variable based on the frame rate in your updater, which you shouldn't do, just use the DT argument to, to do anything with the frame rate in your updaters. In case you do that still, and you want the wait function to do to work properly and keep updating throughout, then you can pass frozen frame equals false to the self.wait that you usually call. If you do that, Manim will ignore the fact that there are no updaters and still compute every single frame uh, that happens during the wait animation. Otherwise, it, it just freezes the frame and, and well duplicates that one because there's nothing happening anyways, from Manim's point of view at least. Let's look at the example that combines updating and animations and look at how we can suspend an object from updating. Uh, I'll call the, the new scene that we create uh, updater and animation. I'm seen. I'll first create a red dot and then I'll make a square that, that keeps rotating. So let's have a red dot. We again shift it left. We will add the rotating square. And we'll make the square rotate by actually adding an updater that makes it rotate. So rotating square add updater. We use the inline function notation again. So lambda mobject and dt. Mobject.rotate by some angle, let's say pi times dt, which means that in one second it does uh, 180 degree um, rotation. Let's again use the, the shifter function from above. Could copy it, but let's write it again. We have a shifter function object dt, uh, which makes the object shift by 2 dt times right. So in one second, two units to the right. And we add it to the red dot again. Add updater 
uh, shifter. Let's add both those to the scene, wait for one second, and then we will suspend the updating of the red dot. So we will self.add. And let's wait for a second, which means the square has done half a rotation and the dot has moved two units to the right. And then we red dot dot suspend updating just without any arguments. And then we wait for another second so that we can see what happens actually. So dot wait again. And then let's play an animation that involves both the dot and the square. So let's have the red dot animate shift up and at the same time the square will also move it somewhere rotating square animate move to let's move the square to coordinates minus two minus two zero because originally it's in the origin so it, let's move it to uh, down left minus two minus two zero so that we can see something happening and then we wait once more there we go all right so Initial observation, the dot is shifted left, the square is added to the scene, the square should rotate and the dot should move right for one second. Right, happens. Square is still rotating, the dot arrived uh, at its position, the updating of the dot has been suspended. Next thing that should happen is the dot should move up and the square should move to the uh, bottom left. Right. And you see, we did not ex explicitly um, resume the updating of the dot, it still did that. So let's look at it again. Dot moves, stops moving, and after the animation of the dot has played, the dot continues to move again, so the updating is resumed automatically. The square, at the same time, continues to rotate during the animation. Anim is able to con combine like a simple method animation um, and the, the updater function together that, that's possible in, in many in many situations it doesn't work for all animations but for the, the usual ones let's say it should work pretty well actually in principle i could cut it right here i don't think there's that much more to say about updater functions actually but in fact there's one concept that's kind of related to them that i that i couldn't miss out on explaining in, in this particular scope that we are in right now meet value trackers um, whenever you are in the situation that you have like one particular number, one parameter that you would like to change and then have a smooth animation of changing, then value trackers are the way to go. Basically, those are invisible mock tracks that store a number. And as such, you can also use Malim's animation mechanism to well, animate how they change. Uh, I'll give you an example on the slide here and, and then we'll uh, get back to the editor and, and discuss a more complicated example together again. So this example here, we construct a number line uh, ranging from minus 5 to 5 and then we add a value tracker with initial value of 0. What I want to do is I want to have an arrow located over some particular position of the number line and I just want to, want to change the, 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 this one coordinate so to say uh, to, to move the arrow around. So in first step this could be 0 then I maybe want to have the, the move the arrow to like uh, 4 then back to minus two and so on and so forth. And that's what, what where the value trackers really shine because the uh, you can you can animate the, the change from, from the initial value of the value tracker or the current value of the value tracker to some other value you can animate that smoothly, which is great. I'll construct the, the corresponding pointer, uh, which is just a vector which points down. And then we stick this pointer to the tracked position. Instead of just putting the, the arrow like above position zero and then updating it so weirdly, I'll write an updater that uses the value of the current value track. So this zero that's currently stored in the position variable somehow. And I'll do that like this. Uh, we construct this inline function here, which tells the object to be placed next to our number line and above of the point on the number line that's, that corresponds to the, the number currently stored in the position value tracker. So this here gets the current value of the value tracker. Uh, it puts it into the line.number to point method, which basically gives you back the point which this corresponds to on the number line. And then we place it next to this and above to this, so that vector gets placed above of the above of the point. We run the update of once just to make sure that everything is, is is set in place. And you can do that whenever you please actually. Whenever you need to run your your updaters manually, you can just call mobject.update and then the uh, update all the updaters that, that are attached to the object are 
executed. And then we can animate the change of the value tracker, basically by, well, treating it as any other object. We use the animate syntax and we can call position.animate.setValue, which is the, the method that allows changing the value of the value tracker, uh, to 4. And then in the next step, we set it to 2. And the video that results, well, you can see it right here. As the value of the value tracker gets set to 4, the arrow moves right. And as it gets set to 2, it moves all the way uh, to the left, minus 2. And that's it. That's uh, the basic use of, of value trackers. You can treat them like any other object, and you can animate them like any other object, which is particularly useful. Let's discuss one uh, somewhat more involved example using value trackers in, in different capacities. Uh, and then we'll actually conclude this video. Okay, there we go. The thing that I'd like to do is the following. I'd like to plot a parabola, y equals ax squared, and a should be a parameter that we can control using a value tracker. So whenever we change the value of the value tracker, the function plot should also change. Let's get started. So I'll create a new class. We'll create the value tracker initially with value one. So a equals a value tracker uh, with initial value one. I'll create some x's with the x range from minus two two in steps of one and the y range ranging from minus 8.5 to 8.5 are also in steps of one. I'll also specify an x length and y length because I want to kind of keep the, the aspect ratio of my plot in some region that I, I prefer. All right, now with some axes present, we can also plot the initial version of the parabola. Parabola is a plot, lambda x, it doesn't really matter what I put here because in the next step I will need to change that anyways. I will need to make some sort of, of, of plot that depends on the value tracker. I, I won't do that for the initial version, uh, but you could obviously. You could also put the value tracker here. It doesn't matter really though because this, what you put, what you input here isn't reused later on, unfortunately. Uh, and let's make it red. All right. Now to this, to this plotted curve, to this parametric curve, we will add the value tracker. So parabola uh, add updater we will add an updater that, that respects the value tracker and the way that you can usually do this is with the become method uh, you can change one object into another one basically so most properties from the other object that are then uh, taken over to the original one so we can pass a function lambda object doesn't need to be time dependent just say object come access.plot and here we specify now again is an inline function the function that we want to plot this time with the value tracker present so this time we need to say lambda uh, a dot get value for our parameter times x squared uh, and again the color should be red all right we have the inline function done Ah, uh, I forgot the x and the lambda function. Now it works. And now what I'll also do is, I kind of want to show the value, the current value of the of the uh, update somewhere. Manim has a few tricks for that, actually. Uh, one of them that allows you to, to show like a rapidly changing number is a so-called decimal number object. I'll show you how it works. Uh, a number equals decimal number. We pass the current value of the parameter, so a dot get value. The color can be red. A number of decimal places, let's put set to three. And then we also show the ellipsis. Show ellipsis equals true. All right. And now we will also add an update to this decimal number. So the decimal number should also get an updater. which changes the value of the decimal number and will also make it uh, so that it, it is positioned next to the parabola. So, object, uh, object set value, value tracker, a.getValue. So now this uh, the value of the object, the value of the, of the number of the object that actually is shown on screen. Um, the value of that is set to the value of the value tracker, which is exactly what we want. And we place it next to our parabola. 
let's put it right right beside it all right let's add everything animate some stuff and show uh, and, and look at the rendered animation so we add the axis the parabola and the decimal number that we just constructed the number and then let's play a animate set value to two self dot play a animate set value to minus two and then let's set it back to one uh, self dot play a dot animate uh, set value back to one in the end all right that's it that's the somewhat more involved scene let's look at the rendered out there we go all right there it is let's look at it so you can see the update has already placed correctly right next to the uh, parabola the pra this is the initial state of the parabola the current value is one this is one times x squared that is plotted and as we play this is two times minus two and back to one you can see that the last frame actually isn't shown properly usually adding a, a weight in the end fixes that but for it doesn't really matter so much for us now and that's it so the parabola changes made it so that it becomes the, the parabola that we actually wanted to see with the updated version of the, the value tracker value well and this concludes our basic intro to update the functions and now i would like to hear from you um, do you find updates a little bit less mysterious now are there any further questions concerning updates that we should maybe discuss in a future episode let me know in the comments down below leave a like in case you found this helpful and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next episode.